plan is to kind of be a little looser today and maybe not even use the full full hour. I just kind of, uh, I'll pick up where I kind of, you know, ended things last time with a couple of questions and maybe, you know, talk a little bit about some, you know, other kind of directions that this uh, uh, circle of ideas goes. So we'll, we'll see how long, uh, how long it'll take. So, um, so let me just say where I left things off uh, yesterday which is that um, I was giving some examples of, you know, what I guess on the one hand, we have this kind of, you know, these, what I was calling these Gopu Kumar Bafan variants, although to really be worthy of the name, they kind of have to satisfy the conjecture, but, you know, kind of some proposed onsets for defining these things, which again, really involve kind of, you know, one-dimensional sheaves, uh, along with um, kind of moduli of one-dimensional sheets, and then it's kind of you know perverse sheets that lives on the moduli space, uh, and then kind of studying the how it behaves with respect to the map of the Chow variety, you kind of cook up some numbers, and then the kind of you know the main kind of you know conjecture would be how does it relate to the kind of more traditional perf counting theories on X, and the one that I was interested in was this kind of stable pairs theory. So, you know, yesterday, what I kind of spent most of the lecture talking about was uh, what I view as the kind of the most general piece of evidence that we have, which is that if you have, you know, basically an integral curve, it's not, it needs to be stronger. The push forward needs to be integral, but I'm just going to be a little sloppy about it here uh, inside of the total space of the conical bundle. Of the and then, I mean, the statement is kind of non trivial in the sense that it requires both understanding some perverse filtration. And this kind of mysterious chief on the moduli space, um, but then nevertheless, using just the fact that um, some kind of formal properties of these constructions, uh, you're able to pr prove it essentially by reducing it to kind of a much simpler case, the case of um, uh, locally planar curves. Um, and so, I mean, one. Let me just mention one kind of question I have, and I mean, in some sense, that kind of. Um, Two step that's kind of two step reduction, um, you know, is is one of the main things I wanted to explain because that kind of technique shows up in a lot of different contexts, and so uh, and it's, it's something that I've personally found very useful in the last few years. Um, let me just kind of mention two pieces of speculation uh, in this direction, which are not, I mean I am I hesitate to almost write anything down because they're not somehow these are kind of half cooked ideas. But one, you know, kind of, kind of some kind of questions I have <laughs> is that um, so the you know the way I kind of explained this uh, procedure uh, in my lecture yesterday is that I used um, you know I, I use this kind of uh, perverse continuation idea where you kind of show some perverse sheaves have full support and so then if you want to prove something about them you can prove them over the generic point where it's just a local system all the curves are smooth and you're in this kind of very classical situation. And so I kind of use this kind of support theorem. This is some kind of questions. Uh, in the first step. And the, I mean, one thing that's happened, you know, the, so that work of Go is pretty old. One thing that's happened kind of in the intervening years is that there's been kind of a, a you know, major advance in how we kind of think about a lot of those uh, older questions, which is this work of uh, Grochenig. Wies and uh, Ziegler, where they, they basically give a much more kind of, you know, flexible way of proving many of the results, maybe not quite as strong as what uh, Ngo does, but for, for all intents and purposes, for all applications, uh, their techniques are, are just as good and they're much more flexible. They have much less stringent hypotheses on the families in question. Essentially via kind of some, you know, some version of piatic integration, although, you know, kind of, you know, some maybe more sophisticated way than was done in the, in the nineties. Um, and so this, I mean, this is extremely beautiful work and, you know, uh, in his talk earlier, he, he alluded to a little bit in his talk earlier this week. Um, 
And so, you know, one question that I have is, you know, how does that interact with this kind of circle of ideas? So I want, you know, you know, you can imagine that there's kind of a, a, a more systematic way of thinking about some of the stuff that uh, I was doing uh, yesterday where you kind of, you know, use their approach to things instead of, instead of this kind of more heavily uh, perverse sheath of approach. But maybe how. <clears throat> And I'm leaving it open ended because I don't really have a good feel for what the answer should look like. Although I think it is reasonable to expect that there is uh, some kind of fruitful interaction there. Now, the other question I have, which is again also kind of not even half baked, um, is that you know so you know the way this argument worked for you know you, you have imagined gamma some kind of very complicated space curve singularity, uh, and then you kind of push it down onto the surface where it becomes planar, and then you kind of use this kind of, you know, theory there. Um, when you study, let's say, reduced planar uh, singularities, so for locally planar singularities, the moduli spaces that show up, is if you look at, for instance, the compactified Jacobian of a curve with locally planar singularities, uh, these are, you know, very closely related to uh, what are called affine Springer fibers in type A. Which so, so came up in Eugene's talk last week and then also um, Peng Shen's talk yesterday. And so I, one question that I've always wondered is what is there, is there you know, a role for these you know, space curve singularities? Is there some kind of analogous you know, uh, role for them to play in geometric representation theory where you wouldn't take the cohomology of these kinds of spaces, you would take the kind of cohomology uh, with you know values in this kind of sheaf that we've added on top of it. So maybe I'll write it like this. This is you know the contribution of this curve gamma to this moduli space. So maybe I'll write it. And I mean, I don't even in this case, I don't really even have an idea for what that what 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 um, what you could ask for. But I, th I think this is a direction that I think um, is worth exploring. And actually, um, uh, Dory uh, Bedgeleri, he had I, at some point he had some speculation along these lines, although I don't know how uh, how precise it was. Okay. Um, so what I'd like to talk about today next is maybe uh, what are the so th these. This kind of, this is kind of you know in some sense the most general evidence we have for this kind of uh, connection, uh, and it's you know obviously still a pretty restricted situation, but in, uh, there's some generality to it in which um, the singularities of gamma are um, very bad. And so what I'd like to first do in today's lecture is just talk about some kind of non-reduced example. You see the, this kind of relationship between these two theories in the in the integral case is kind of the simplest. Basically, um, you know, you, you look at the PT theory in, in this class gamma, and you look at the this common Kopf-Kormov-Vaf invariance of this class gamma, and then they just match up with some denominator thrown in. But if you have a, a non-reduced or a reducible cycle, then there are going to be all these corrections that come from effective subcycles, and um, so. In some sense, the, the relation is much more complicated than that thing. And so I think it's, it's kind of important to have examples where, where it's true there. And it, we don't have so many, but here there are kind of two main sorts of examples where, uh, where you can produce examples where it's true. And so, okay, so let me just say that here. So the relation now. So let's say the contribution of the stable pairs and variance for this class gamma in terms of mg gamma prime. And this is in particular where that kind of exponential and stuff really show up. And so the, the first source of examples where it works out is by taking uh, flops.
So a flop is a situation where you have a Calabi out threefold. And you have a birational equivalence with, with another Calabi out threefold, which I'll call, you know, X cross, which is, you know, a different, you have some contraction of X and you have some kind of different resolution um, of the contraction Y and where the exceptional loss I are curves and, you know, X and X prime are isomorphic um, in co-dimension one. So this is, it's basically, you know, there's going to be some kind of curves here that kind of get contracted and then, you know, you, know, you blow them up again and get some new curves in X prime. And so there's, all, you know, this in birational geometry, this, this is kind of a well-studied situation. In particular, one thing that you get, which is the theorem of Bridgeland, is that the well, okay, so there's, first of all, the, let's call this birational map, um, maybe not C, uh, call it, uh, oh. you can identify the, you know, H2 on these two threefolds, although effective curves may or may not go to effective curves on the other side. And then there's a theorem of Bridgeland that actually gives you a, a derived equivalence between the derived category of coherent sheaves on these two threefolds. And what that means is that you can take a, you know, a coherent sheaf, like our one, one, our moduli of one dimensional sheaves or a moduli space of stable pairs, and you can apply this um, derived equivalence and then you'll get a family of now not necessarily sheaves on the other side, but maybe more complicated complexes. So assume you're in a situation where you have a kind of a one cycle. Let's say an effective one cycle on X. You have to think a little bit about what this means, but it makes sense to talk about what it's push forward is to the other side. It'll be a class, it'll be a, a cycle in the class corresponding to this uh, identification between H2 of X and H2 of X cross, but you can actually kind of refine that to get an honest to God one cycle. I'll call gamma prime. Assume this is also effective. It's not always true, but it often is. For instance, if you start off with an irreducible curve that isn't uh, contained in the exceptional locus of X, you'll get some effective curve on uh, effective one cycle on X prime, but typically it'll now be reducible and have multiplicities and so on. And so the theorem, which uh, you can over proved, is that if you calculate the you know, contribution to the Gopakomarov off invariance on each side, they just match up on the nose. When I say local, that means I'm, I'm just taking the contribution just at this one point of the Chow variety, the local invariance I defined yesterday. I'm going to put a little asterisk, a star here. The star here is because, uh, as always, you know, there are these, to define these invariants, there was this choice of orientation I had to make. So the assumption is that you can kind of pick orientations on both sides. We call these Calabi hour orientations. And so again, you know, what he's doing is he's taking a one-dimensional sheaf, moving it over to the other side, and then kind of uh, analyzing what you get on the other side. And similarly, this is an older result of, again, also Yuknobu and John Calabrese. The stable pairs invariance on X and X prime can be related. This is a little bit more complicated relationship, but again, there's some kind of very explicit relationship between stable pairs on one side and stable pairs on the other side. And again, the technique of proof is always the same. You have a sheaf or a complex of sheaves now, and you apply this derived equivalence to get something on the other side, and you just see how far away that is from a stable pair on the other side. 
So I, I won't write down this relation explicitly just because it's a little complicated. But the upshot is again, su subject to these conjectures, this basically gives you uh, that if you know the kind of correct relationship on one side of your flock, it implies it for the other as well. You can just follow what's supposed to be expected behavior of these Gopal Kumar Voth invariants under this more complicated relation. And what's nice is that this, you know, kind of flopped one cycle, gamma prime, actually can look very different from gamma. So, so this gives examples. You know, gamma could be one of these examples that we've already proven the theorem for in the integral. And then gamma prime will look kind of, you know, we'll have different singularities, we'll have lots of components, we'll have multiplicities. Non-reduced, non-planar. Okay. So this is the kind of the first main example we have of kind of non-reduced one cycles where things work out. Uh, the second example is actually classical, but it still gives, I think, a, quite, a, a kind of an interesting check. And this has to do with uh, Higgs bundles. And in fact, most of what I want to say for the rest of today's lecture is really about this case of Higgs bundles. So, okay, so this is kind of a more classical moduli space. And so let me just kind of go over what the definition is, if you haven't seen it before. So the starting point for Higgs bundles is you start off with a smooth projective curve. The moduli space of Higgs bundles on this curve, rank R, and then I'll set chi equal to B is I take two pieces of data. It's going to be a vector bundle. So E is locally free of rank R. I fix its Euler characteristic to be D. And then phi is a uh, twisted endomorphism of E. So it's A map from E to E twisted by the canonical bundle of my curve. So kind of fiber-wise, it's it looks like an endomorphism of fiber, but globally it's kind of twisted by this canonical bundle. And okay, there's some kind of stability condition to get this to work. And so this is some, you know, this is really just a smooth moduli space. It's a smooth quasi-projective variety. You could also consider more general kinds of twists. So the ones that kind of or better understood is when I kind of further twist by an affected divisor on my curve. So it's all the same definitions, except now my twisted endomorphism goes to, I twist by the canonical bundle with a little bit of extra. And this, this twist makes a surprising amount of uh, difference in the theory. So both of these spaces, so this kind of regular Higgs and this kind of twisted variation on it, um, carry what are called uh, Hitchin maps. So these are maps, just the affine spaces. So in the case of the Higgs space, the original Higgs space, the way this is kind of traditionally thought about is that you have this twisted endomorphism, and then you just kind of take the twisted characteristic polynomial. So at every kind of point of my curve, I could take the characteristic polynomial of the endomorphism of the fiber, and th that'll give me, you know, the coefficients of that. Um, and then as I kind of study how it behaves on the twist, I end up with an element of, let's see if I write this correctly. <coughs> Excuse me. 
This is basically taking the characteristic polynomial of the Higgs field. And if I do it with poles, I, I mean, I can do the same thing. If I have, if I have this kind of, you know, instead of K, I do K twisted by D, I, get, I just take global sections of K of D to the I. And so the, the, in, in either of these situations, these are, you know, proper maps. And generically, the fibers of this uh, map are, um, um, you know, uh, basically Jacobians of some curve that covers C. And so this is very similar to the situation I had yesterday. This kind of generically looks like, um, like some kind of family of abelian varieties, but then the fibers get very badly singular. And so it's similar to what I was doing yesterday when I was considering versal families of planar curves. So what does this have to do with kind of collapse? So these are, you know, whatever, these have been studied forever. These are some kind of nice classical moduli problems. So what do they have to do with this kind of Calabiao um, story? Well, the idea is that you can kind of embed these problems into the kind of Calabiao moduli problems we've been looking at in, in kind of a dumb way. It's kind of amazing to me that this ends up being a useful way of thinking about it. So first, um, if I let me do just do the right case of, um, I guess I'll do both at the same time. So first, I can take a surface. So I start off with a curve, and I can associate to this curve a non-compact surface, which is just the total space of the canonical bundle or the total space of the canonical bundle twisted by d. And the, and the first, so you can think of this. This is kind of like a non-compact, you know, K three surface. Non-compact trivial, and this is kind of like a non-compact Fano surface. And then, if you just think about what does it mean to give you, let's say, a one-dimensional sheaf on this surface? Well, if I, if this if that support of the sheaf is proper over the curve, that's the same. If I push it forward, I'm giving you a vector bundle on the curve with one of these twisted endomorphisms. So, one-dimensional sheaves on these surfaces really correspond to either these moduli spaces of Higgs bundles. And then what is this Hitchin map? So, th so, the, so the, if I look at one dimensional sheaves on the surface, this ends up just being the same as the corresponding Higgs space. And then this Hitchin map ends up just being the map to the linear system of the surface. So the, the Chow variety of the surface, which just remembers really the support of this one dimensional sheet, ends up being exactly this kind of base of the Hitchin map. But actually, I, I don't really want to work with surfaces. I want to work with Claudia threefold. So I'm going to do kind of, you know, the same thing that I've been doing always to take a surface and turn it into a Claudia threefold, which is that I'll take the total space of the canonical bundle of the surface. So this is going to be my X, which in the first case is just, you know, the total space of this rank two bundle on my curve. Well, in both cases, it is. And so now if I take my kind of curve class beta on this non-compact Calabi at threefold to be, you know, R times the zero section, then this moduli space that I've been interested in, one dimensional sheaves or the characters one, well, uh, this just ends up being kind of, let's say the twisted Higgs, K, uh, Higgs uh, moduli space, let's say for D equals one on my curve when D is greater than zero. And in the case without the poles, I just get um, the regular Higgs space on my curve. Uh, but then cross a copy of A1. That's because in this case, in the K3 case, when I've done the total bundle, total space of the canonical bundle of the surface, that's just taking S cross A1. So there's always going to be this trivial A1 factor. So this is my moduli space on my Calabia threefold. And up to this factor of A1, it exactly recovers the kind of classical moduli spaces that people have studied. And then what I was saying earlier, the kind of thing that we've been looking at is we've been looking at this moduli space of one-dimensional sheaves on the Calabia threefold, and I'm mapping it to the Chow variety of the Calabia threefold. And in this case, again, this is just ends up being exactly the Hitchin map.
maybe with this extra copy of A1 floating around. But again, this includes, what's nice about this geometry is that from the perspective of what, um, of what I'm interested in, um, this includes um, one cycles that are uh, non-reduced, reducible, and so on. The, the support of the sheaf in this case, depending on which point of the chow variety I'm looking at, it can be, uh, be non-reduced. The most extreme example is when um, I Higgs field endomorphism is nilpotent. And then the corresponding support is just R, literally R times the zero section. So it's kind of non-reduced with multiplicity R. And then what are the, these kind of Gopal Kumar Vasa invariants in this case? Well, all right, so again, what are we doing? So in this case, M beta is smooth because it's just this Higgs moduli space. And then, you know, up to the shift, what I'm interested in is I take the kind of perverse cohomology sheaves when I push forward to the Chow variety, namely the Hitchin base, and I take their Euler characteristics as sheaves on, the, on this base. And so, Concretely, one way of thinking about that is that I'm taking that kind of, I have this kind of perverse, kind of extra perverse uh, filtration or grading even on the cohomology of M beta, which is just this Higgs moduli space. And then I'm just forgetting, right? Because I'm taking this Euler characteristic, I forget the cohomological degree and just remember this kind of the perverse degree. So I'm remembering this kind of which perverse cohomology sheaf it's coming from, but I don't necessarily care what the uh, what the um, cohomological degree was. And what's nice is that this has been you know studied a lot. <laughs> so in D equals zero, meaning the case of you know traditional Higgs bundles. This object is exactly the subject of what's called the P equals W conjecture. Non-abelian Hodge theory. This is kind of a big subject and super interesting, but, I, so I, but I'll just give the, the part that's relevant for us, which is that, you know, so again, D equals zero. So I'm just doing Higgs bundles where I'm twisting by the canonical bundle and not, nothing more. What this says is that if I looked at a moduli space of Higgs bundles, there is a, um, a certain diffeomorphism, so some kind of C infinity diffeomorphism with the character variety of the curve, which is, you know, this involves maps from the, you know, topological fundamental group of the curve, uh, maybe with the puncture, but maybe. Um, GLR modulo of conjugation, and with the property that the kind of the loop around the puncture gets sent to a certain root of unity. So, um, this is what's called the twisted character variety. This is a, a diffeomorphism, but of course it's not an algebraic uh, map because the right-hand side is an affine variety. Some kind of you know, kind of exotic construction, but since you have a diff diffeomorphism, you can identify the singular cohomology. So this, on the one hand, the Higgs space gets identified canonically with the cohomology of this character variety. So this is some kind of you know known thing. The conjecture, um, which is due to uh, 
Cataldo, Housel, and Migliorini. Is that okay? On the left hand side, I have this kind of extra information coming from um, kind of perverse sheaves on this chow variety, which is just the Hitchin Bay. So. And on the right hand side, I have well, this is an affine variety. So if I look at its cohomology, it has a non trivial uh, weight filtration. And the conjecture is that these are also identified. There's a, I have to like scale the grading by two or something like that, but I'm going to skip that. So why is that relevant for us? Well, this is the thing we're interested in. If I forget the cohomology degree, I just remember the perverse degree. That's the thing that we want for these gopal kumar boff invariants. If I believe this conjecture, then I can compute it instead by looking at the cohomology of this character variety where I only remember the weights. And this is something that you can actually compute. So this is done by uh, uh, Housel, uh, Latelier, uh, and Rodriguez uh, Viega. Sorry, I'm just going to use <laughs> initials for, for the sake of time, which is that if you're only interested in the, uh, the kind of the weight polynomial of the character variety, you can do it. This is a uh, This is something that you compute by point counting. It's kind of, it's, a, it's a cool story because it, it's really related to um, you know basically you replace this um, group GLR with GLR over a finite field and it's something you can compute using the representation theory of GLR over a finite field. But you can do it, and then what was observed uh, later on by uh, uh, trying the Akinescu and Pan. Is that this matches when you kind of go through this entire procedure, this matches on the nose what you would expect from the stable Paris theory of X. X in this case being this kind of local curve, it's the total space of the K plus L. Which on the numerical level is not hard to compute. So this is kind of an extremely long chain of reasoning and it's kind of built on this conjecture, <laughs> but it means that every time, every case where this conjecture is proven, you then get the corresponding uh, connection with the, between the Gopal-Kumarov variance and the, and the stable pairs theory. So the upshot here is that basically anytime you have the P equals W conjecture, it implies the kind of bromo witten PT relation. Uh, sorry, the Gopal Kumar Bafa PT relation in this case. And so in particular, we know this conjecture, for instance, we know this when the rank is two, this was in, done in this original paper, the conjecture was formulated. Uh, we also know it, so this is R equals two, but genus can be arbitrary. And we also know it when the genus is two and the rank is arbitrary. More recently, work of uh, Cataldo, myself, and uh, Junliang Shen. And so, in particular, in these cases, everything here is you know ironclad, and then you really do get kind of provable cases. Um, so what is special in, in genus two? Sorry, say that again. Uh, so, what, what kind of feature of curves of genus two you use to? Uh... I'm sorry. Could I, I'm sorry. Could you try so that one more time? Genus two. You mean why? What's why can we only? Why can we only prove it in genus two? Yes. That, oh yeah. Uh, well, yeah. That's kind of a complicated story. I mean, the way the the way the proof goes in this paper is that we prove the theorem uh, by embedding um, by embedding a genus two curve uh, inside of its uh, Jacobian, and then studying one-dimensional sheaves on this uh, abelian surface. And so what's special about genus two is that uh, there's kind of, you know, basically the cohomology of the Hitchin space uh, is, you know, surjected onto by the cohomology of this compact hyperkähler variety. Uh, so there is a theorem that you get for higher genus, but you only kind of get it on some piece of the cohomology of the Hitchin space. So there's a 
there's a there's a version of this theorem that works for arbitrary genus, but it's not strong enough for this application because you only get a, a certain subalgebra of the cohomology for which the conjecture holds. And then what's going on in the rank two case is the rank two case, even though the genus is arbitrary, you actually have a complete presentation of the cohomology of these of these uh, the Hitchin space, and so you can really kind of write down all the generators and relations and see where they go and match them up and what what piece of the filtration you want. Um, so the, these the, these two proofs are very different in the sense that this first one is kind of you know uses a lot more information about the cohomology. Uh, the right hand side uses kind of you know fact that um, um, you you kind of can embed, you know there's a compact geometry that kind of governs the story without any loss of information. Um, what are the kind of next cases I think to think about? So my feeling with this whole, this relation is it's still kind of in the stage of, you know, every example kind of shed some light on what's going on. So for me, what I think is kind of the, the most accessible, accessible one, actually, I mean, the, the one that's kind of, you know, I think really low hanging fruit that we, we, we didn't pursue, but I, not for strong reasons, was that um, when, we, you, when you study local surfaces, uh, you know, we only restricted ourselves to the situation where the, um, the push forward of the one cycle, so the local surfaces of the form, the total space of the canonical bundle on the surface. So we kind of restricted ourselves to the situation where this was uh, integral. But I, I think with, you know, with a little bit of, you know, elbow grease, it should be possible just to handle kind of, you know, reducible instead. Re reduced and reducible should be okay too. The statement is more complicated because now you have corrections coming from these kind of irreducible components. But still, you know, the, the situation is sufficiently nice in the sense that, you know, uh, this theorem of uh, myself and uh, Yun and Migliorini and Chende has already been extended in the locally planar case to this setting with the right corrections. But more interesting in the local surface case is, you know, non reduced. <laughs> and in fact, already, you know, the, the kind of, you know, this. The simplest example where I think, you know, this is still open is, you know, when maybe the moduli spaces are kind of still smooth. So for instance, if I take uh, the total space, the local surface for like a, a Del Pezzo surface or something like that, in this case, the moduli space is smooth. And I think understanding what's going on there is, um, is very interesting. And I, I you know, I, I think accessible as well, although, you know, maybe not as easy. What's interesting in this case is that the, if I look at a stable one dimensional sheaf on this threefold, it's scheme theoretically supported on the surface. But on the stable pair side, the, the one dimensional sheaf that I'm taking sections of will be thickened off of the surface. And that, that kind of leads to some contributions. And you can see that in the conjecture. And an example that uh, Jim Bryan mentioned to me is something that he's kind of interested in, I should mention. Yeah, and Brian is um, still the local curve geometry. So like what I was doing in the Hitchin case, but maybe not where you kind of twist it. So the spaces are all smooth. So for instance, um, to take if I have a curve and I could take um, a theta characteristic of the curve, so it's a choice of square root of the canonical bundle. And he's been interested in kind of basically understanding what's going on in this kind of geometry. And then the last case, which I, I mean, the last kind of specific example that I think would kind of shed a light on it, on what's going on a little bit more is the following, which is again, I'm gonna take, it'll be a local curve geometry, but I'm not going to have, assume that the normal bundle is split. 
So let's take uh, N, which is a kind of a generic rank two bundle. It's determinant the canonical bundle of the curve. And then I just take the total space of this rank two bundle. And so this is a little bit like what you would, this is kind of what you would get if you, you know, when I was talking about uh, on Wednesday, I was talking about how one way of thinking about these conjectures is that you imagine you're in an ideal situation where all your curves and your Calabi out threefold or maybe like smooth and isolated and rigid in some sense. And you could try to, you know, imagine what it would co contribute. And, you know, one of the issues is that, um, so this is kind of an example of what you would get if you thought about it that way. But what's interesting about it, and you can see uh, in this case, is that if you consider, let's do, for instance, the simplest case that I already don't know how to do, which is beta is just two times the class of the curve. And so set theoretically, if I look at the moduli space here, What I get is I just get uh, rank two stable bundles. I get I'll call this. In particular, you know, none of the sheaves that show up are thickened in any way. And so you might think, well, all right, this is great. Uh, you know, we know we've known for you know millennia with the cohomology of the moduli of rank two stable bundle is, so I should just be able to compute the invariance and see what happens. But uh, what happens is that actually this is not a scheme theoretic equality. So M beta actually has some kind of non-reduced structure, which is a little mysterious in the sense that, you know, I, you can kind of see what the, where, you know, the locus that it's supported on the non-reduced structure, but, you know, I don't have a good feel for what, um, what it looks like. And I mean, the, why you have this non-reduced structure is just something you can see um, if, let's say, if, uh, if F is a, a rank two stable bundle. You know, the tangent space to the moduli space of stable bundles on the curve is something like, you know, X1 of, on the curve of F comma F. And there's a map from here to X1 on the threefold of push forward, but there's some, you know, long exact sequence and there's a non-trivial co-kernel here that can happen. Generically it's zero, but then non-generically with some uh, piece here, which is something like hom of, uh, I want to say plus F, but F tensor N. And this group can be non-zero and in particular this, this group can be strictly larger than this one. So it's kind of like some kind of Brill nether question on this moduli space, but affects the cohomology. Um, all right. And so, okay, so I, 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 in terms of studying this conjecture, this is, I think, are the kind of main examples to think about next. But let me kind of conclude with just another direction, which I actually was planning on spending maybe half, half an hour talking about, but I'll just, I'll just say a few words about it. So kind of the, the other direction in this circle of ideas has to do with what are called, you know, kind of kind dependence questions. You know, in some version, this was conjectured uh, in, you know, my work with Yukonobu and then kind of more systematically in a paper he wrote in the semi-stable case. And it has to do with, some, with a choice I made at the very beginning when I defined these invariants. So when we defined This approach to Gopal-Kumar Voth invariance. What I did is I started off with the moduli space of one-dimensional sheaves, and which one did I take? I took, you know, sheaves uh, where the support was in class beta, and then I fixed the Euler characteristic to be one. And so you could ask why? What was special about chi equals one? Why did we pick that? And, and the answer in some version is, it's, you know, in some sense it's just laziness. You see when chi is equal to one, you don't have to pick a polarization to define stability.
But if you're willing to make that kind of choice, then you could have picked any value for this uh, for chi, and you know you could still get a moduli space. So the simplest case is when you know you pick some integer k, and you know assume that in some appropriate sense it's relatively prime to the curve class. So you don't have to worry about semi-stables at first. And so now you get a moduli space and sigma beta k, where sigma here is some kind of stability condition that you have to use as well. Maybe coming coming from let's say a polarization, and so just as I did before, hold on a second. Ah, you can define some invariance now depending on this integer, which is the value of pi, and then also the stability. So I mean, then the so the first conjecture, which you know we made in our paper just to deal with this objection, was that okay. In fact, all, none of this mattered. Whatever choices you made here is independent both of this stability, which is and 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 this um, and this choice of uh, chi that you would pick. And in fact, the independence of of the stability condition this actually was proven later on. By Yukonovu. Again, um, uh, under you know uh, under some assumption that these orientation issues work out. And if you want, I mean, you could even ask for something stronger. We never formally made this conjecture, but you know, I, which is that you have this math from your moduli space for the Chow variety. And the Chow variety doesn't require any choice of um, stability or doesn't depend on what K is. It only depends on what beta is. And then you could just ask for this push forward of the, you know, this DT sheaf, which depends on sigma and K just to be independent. K and sigma. This is this is a little surprising. Depending on your point of view, this is either surprising or not surprising. So you see, um, so why is this kind of you know not surprising <laughs> that you, something like this might be true? Um, if I specialize all the way to Euler characteristics, I mean, I look, I just take the gene of zero thing. So the gene of zero statement that kind of you know n zero beta. Sigma k is independent. Uh, this is actually conjectured a long time ago. This is in fact a prerequisite. This is you know equivalent to this uh, strong rationality conjecture that I stated. So this is something that people have been interested in for some time, and you know, basically it boils down to the independence of these numbers on all these choices. And so this is just some kind of you know souped up version of that, and you know whatever reason is making this numerical statement true is maybe also making this kind of sheaf theoretic statement true. So from the point of view of this kind of DT perspective, this is not we did not view this as a big leap. Uh, but if, it is a little more surprising from the classical point of view. Well, surprising is maybe too strong a word, but it's a little. In the following sense, which is that, um, let's say I take a, a smooth curve of genus G, and then I take the moduli space of stable bundles on this curve, where rank R and chi is equal to B. And so assume, and again, let's assume I'm still in the co-prime case. So, you know, you could ask, how does the cohomology of this thing depend on the choice of D? 
And well, I can always twist by like a degree one line bundle and that'll relate, you know, one moduli space with the other moduli space where the degree is shifted by R. But what Harder and Narha Simon showed was that basically other than this move and other than like taking duals, the, in general, these cohomologies are different. So the cohomology Like, so for instance, you know, I think already when the rank is five and then D is one and D prime is two, these spaces are different. These cohomologies are different. And that's a little bit like what I'm asking here. I'm having a moduli space of, you know, things supported on a one dimensional scheme. Uh, and so you could ask why, uh, what's special about this Kalabi out three situation that isn't kind of happening in the case of curves. I don't really know a great answer to that, but one thing that kind of gets explained from this perspective is that, so you see, okay, so there's this very classical question about stable bundles on a curve and you, you don't get any kind of independence of high independent statement. However, if I look at Higgs bundles or twisted Higgs bundles, then in fact, it is true that the cohomologies of these Higgs spaces with or without the D are independent. Of the degree. And so, you know, this is something, let's see, I think this is proven a couple of different ways. I think maybe the first proof was basically by just calculating, <laughs> finding a formula for the, for these Poincaré polynomials. So this was essentially done, I think by uh, Schiffman in the, in the D non-trivial case, maybe Schiffman, Moskovoy, and uh, Gorman is what I wrote down. So there, I think this is a, uh, the final paper that proved this uh, equality here for non-trivial D. And so you might ask, why is it the case that Higgs bundles have this kind of kind dependent statement while just regular stable bundles on a curve do not? And so from my, you know, my perspective, the explanation is just what I said before, this kind of Higgs moduli spaces are secretly some kind of Calabi out three moduli problem. But just stable bundles on a curve or not. There's not, there's not some embedding of the curve into a Calabi out threefold such that the moduli space of one dimensional sheaves is just stable bundles. But then you could push it forward is that you could ask a little bit more here. I just focused on the case when beta and K were co-prime because then this moduli space, I don't have to worry about semi-stable sheaves and like there's some stack and some core space. Um, you can ask if there's a way of pushing beyond that. And the answer is yes, there is. Um, so now uh, there exist semi-stable sheaves. You'll have some kind of stack of semi-stable sheaves with some kind of coarse moduli space which again maps to the Chow variety. And okay, maybe I won't get into the, 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 the intricacies of the construction here, but there is basically a way of modifying everything I said to handle this. So this is developed by Yukonobu, kind of mod, modify, you know, he basically produces a perverse sheaf on this coarse moduli space, which is now we sometimes call the BPS sheaf. And then you can kind of run the same story.
And so already in these kinds of classical moduli spaces, if you specialize, you get kind of some interesting statements. So the kind of something that was proven recently by myself and Jin Liang, if you do twisted, these twisted Higgs bundles, but now in this kind of non coprime case, so this is some kind of, you know, singular coarse moduli space. Well, it turns out that this, you know, whatever this mystery sheaf is, it's somehow, you know, I haven't told you how to define it. It ends up just being intersection cohomology. This is something that was proven by Reinhardt. And this is kind of what you get, and this is actually a theorem that you can prove, is that, you know, so in the, the um, intersection cohomology of the singular variety, twist, uh, is independent of D, and in particular just equals the regular cohomology in the co-prime case. And so this is, you know, and sometimes this is kind of a, a classical statement that you could have formulated in the 70s or something like that. Uh, and, you know, the reason to expect something like this is true, the only one that I can really see is by thinking of it as a kind of a specialization of this, these kinds of considerations. Um, but the analogous statement for if I remove the twist, if I just consider regular Higgs bundles, uh, it's still open. You know, now you don't need intersection cohomology. This total sheaf is gonna be something a little bit more mysterious. And already in that case, we don't know how to prove what should be true there. All right, okay, so I ended up using the full hour, which I, was not my intention, uh, but let me, uh, uh, let me stop here and uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs> thank you. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so why does like the trick to, that you use to go with um, Jun Yang Shen to prove this household values conjecture not work for for example, uh, using uh, this chi independent, doing this chi independent. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting, right? So, so the uh, the the that trick, which I, I didn't, I, you know, I meant to actually talk about that trick a little bit, but you know, with, well, I mean, so what what this trick is about? Just um, let me just say a couple of words about this. So there's this kind of the same technique that I used in yesterday's lecture can also be used just to study questions about Higgs bundles. Higgs bundles are a smooth moduli space. So you wouldn't think it would be so helpful. But the idea is that you can embed them inside of these twisted Higgs bundles as a critical locus. And so this allows you to take statements that are easier to prove for the twisted case and turn them into stasis uh, theorems for the untwisted case. So it's, it's exactly the same kind of philosophy that from uh, yesterday's lecture. And so what happens for these kinds of questions? Well, in order for this to be true, it's important to work with stable Higgs bundles. Uh, the analogous statement is not true for uh, semi-stable Higgs bundles. The critical locus is bigger. So you get some, you know, thing that's true, but it's like, it's, it's the cohomology of some bigger moduli space. So it's not actually the thing that you're interested in. And so then, you know, what you have to do is you have to somehow relate that bigger space uh, with the, maybe the, the, the smaller moduli space that you actually care about. Does that does that uh, answer your question? Yes, thank you. Any other questions? No, let's thank the bitch again. Thank you very much.